My name is Ella Garland and I am a nurse with the Italian Outreach and Consult Team. I'm a nurse on this consult team and I come to you with information um, in that perspective, but I also am a, student, a graduate student member of the iPanel team, as well as uh, a member of a, a student of the University of Victoria, um, just coming up to the finishing finish of my, of my master's. And so what I'm gonna share with you today are my findings from my, my project. So I'm appreciative to be able to do that. So the goals for today um, are really uh, to just briefly go over what a palliative approach is. And uh, I apologize to those of you that have already um, heard that a number of times, but for those of you who haven't, I'll just go over it briefly. And then we're gonna look at the barriers that really inhibit communication at end of life for patients and their families who are living with heart failure. So the background um, information to the iPanel project is, is recognition that there is a gap between research and practice. And so uh, the iPanel, which stands for the Initiative for a Palliative Approach in Nursing Evidence and Leadership, has been funded by the BC Nursing Research Initiative, um, which is seeking to really create linkages between um, academia, uh, the researchers, and, and practice nurses, so that uh, nursing practice can be informed by research, the, the research that is done filters down to nurses, but also that nurses are then also able to have a say in, in um, to kind of articulate what's important for them and for the researchers to look at as well. So create linkages uh, as that. And so uh, iPanel certainly has nurse academics and practice nurses and graduate students as well. So that's just a bit of background on iPanel. So what is a palliative approach? And as I said, this might be very familiar to you, but uh, really just the principles of palliative care are applied to the care of patients, people who are living with life-limiting uh, chronic conditions. Um, the overall goal is to uh, relieve suffering and improve quality of life for patients and their families. And so patients and families certainly is the center of the care, uh, the center of this approach. And really what we are looking to do is to assess the information needs of patients and their family. Do they have uh, health literacy needs? Do they understand what, what's going on within their body, their disease? Um, what are their wishes as, as people are nearing the end of life? What's really important to them? These are often things that, that don't get asked of, of patients, certainly. We also want to look at patients' physical needs, uh, symptom management, are they having pain or um, shortness of breath, dyspnea that is really impacting their, their life? Uh, or is it equipment that could be put into their environment that would make their, their life uh, more comfortable and safer for them and their family? We want to make sure we look at the psychosocial aspects of patients uh, and their family and because we know that chronic diseases certainly take a huge toll on, on patients and families. We want to make sure we don't miss um, spiritual and cultural issues that will have a lot of um, uh, importance to patients and families and that often, again, um, get glossed over or, or missed altogether. And then we really definitely want to look at um, what's important as somebody is nearing the end of their, their, their life, what's important for them, where they die, and then also care of patients and fam or sorry, families uh, after the death. The, the care does not stop just because the patient has died. So who can benefit from a palliative approach? Basically anybody with a life-limiting illness. And for a lot of people um, might be surprised at some of the uh, diseases that you see up there, but really COPD, dementia, all of these diseases are life limiting. And so we're going to be focusing today, of course, on heart failure, but anybody that has life limiting illnesses is by no means is this an extensive list um, that can benefit from a palliative approach should we should be really be using it. A palliative approach can be used anywhere, residential care, acute medical wards or home settings, regardless of the setting, we can apply this approach. And what's, I think, also very important and maybe a new way of looking at a palliative approach is that it's not really linked to a prognosis, but if people have needs. And so you can imagine that when somebody's first diagnosed, say with heart failure, they might not have as many 
um, needs at that time. They may have communication needs, but as they move along uh, uh, in their disease, their, their needs will probably grow. So it's helpful to be in there earlier on in their trajectory. And also important is that a palliative approach can be used along life prolonging therapies. And that is also an important and different kind of perspective for a lot of people, but certainly one that I see as very valued, uh, valuable um, in the heart failure population because they often have a lot of um, technological procedures and, and equipment uh, sometimes inside their body, uh, but it's still a very valuable approach of palliative to work alongside of that. So why are, is the eye panel focusing on a palliative approach? Why, why is that important? And really, all of us, I think, know that there are rising numbers of patients, um, elders, and that along with that come patients with a lot of uh, chronic life-limiting illnesses. And so often these patients live in an indistinct zone of chronic illness. They're, they're not well, but they're also not being viewed as somebody who uh, is, palliative, is, is really close to the end of their life. And sometimes this zone can last years, and patients and families can suffer for years. So it's, uh, that's one of the main reasons for uh, looking at a palliative approach and, and try to apply it to these, this population, these populations. Um, also, you know, a specialized palliative care unit is really not appropriate for all uh, people living with life-limiting illnesses. So I'll speak about St. Paul's Hospital where I work. The palliative care unit there is really used to reserve for patients who have acute symptom management needs. And while some of these patients may have those needs, uh, likely more towards the end of their illness, uh, they certainly have a lot of other needs, uh, um, I would argue, that could really benefit from a palliative approach. And then also, if, if we're involved in a palliative approach is being used from early on, it makes the, tra the transitions in chronic disease conditions, um, I would say, much smoother because the family is, is not shocked by the fact that we're uh, approaching an about end of life. So we're just going to move forward and talk about uh, my project that I used for my master's uh, project. And um, we're going to specifically look, as I mentioned earlier, at the, the barriers to communication and, uh, and how that has huge ramifications for the care of these patients as they near the end of their life. So this problem is, is clinically based. I have the um, uh, privilege of sitting with the heart failure team uh, interdisciplinary team, and the goal of my being there initially was to case find and also to help build capacity within the team, help them identify patients um, that would benefit from a palliative approach, help them identify patients that uh, uh, were actually dying when they were nearing their life, when they themselves didn't seem to recognize that. Um, but what it came down to was, uh, certainly I did that, but I really started to realize gaps in communication were causing a lot of problems because um, um, the nurses would not necessarily know what the family's wishes were. They weren't sure that the patient knew what their disease process was. They weren't sure what these physicians were offering so, or what the physician had said to them. So there was a lot of gaps in communication. So then that became the focus of my, my project. Um, but also um, sitting in with the team and doing some um, literature search, obviously. Um, heart failure population has very similar needs to those patients with cancer. Um, there is very minimal end-of-life communication when compared to, for example, Murray at Elstor of uh, Research, who, who compared the care of patients that had inoperable lung cancer and heart failure and found huge differences in the care. Among them, um, very minimal end-of-life communication and understanding around their disease process. And clearly, not having any idea around um, that you're even nearing end-of-life or, or what's going on within your body clearly impacts end-of-life care. So we're just going to briefly speak about uh, the benefits of communication. And these, this won't come to as a surprise to anybody, I'm sure. But this is specific to the heart failure population. 
Um, and really, not all patients, but most patients really wanted to have opportunities for honest communication. They wanted direct information, uh, but they wanted also want it delivered compassionately. And, and they just want the door open. As one patient said in some of the literature, they wanted a seed planted, even if they didn't want to discuss it right then. Um, obviously, good communication influences emotional well-being, uh, symptomatic relief, functional ability, um, physiological status, and improves coordination of care. So none of that is probably a surprise to us. Poor communication, on the other hand, has a very negative impact on patients' quality of life. Uh, poor symptom management, obviously, would, would, would be uh, one, of the, one of the main uh, things that we think of, but obviously uh, psychological morbidity is also, a, is also a problem. So patients who, who don't have a lot of good communication around what, what their disease process and their, and their prognosis are more prone to anxiety, uh, depression, and anger. They also have been known to, the research shows, get unwanted treatment. So that uh, they sometimes receive CPR when they wouldn't have wanted it or cardiac interventions. In fact, Strachan uh, et al. Uh, performed a research, quantitative research, in acute care facilities across Canada and found that hospitalized patients um, were sometimes receiving more aggressive treatment than they actually would have preferred. But, um, Potentially, uh, it would seem that maybe they ha that hadn't been asked of them. And obviously, poor end-of-life care as well. Um, patients often are not dying in what would have been their chosen place to die uh, because no one has asked them, or patients often may have had that discussion with, with or that, that thought of themselves, but they have not, not communicated that to, um, to their, their family sometimes or, or their healthcare providers. And they often have aware, a poor awareness uh, that death is, is very near. Again, because that communication just has not happened. So given that information, um, this is the question, my research question that I came up with. So what is the current state of knowledge about barriers that interfere with end-of-life communication with patients with heart failure, their carers, and healthcare professionals? So that's a very long question. But I really wanted to uh, kind of get at the problem from all angles that is possible. So goals obviously were to identify the barriers and then to translate the knowledge and try to make a difference um, at, at the bedside level, at the patient level. So the current state of, of knowledge, uh, end-of-life communication in patients with heart failure is, is pretty dismal, I have to say. And it, you know, the literature spanned over um, I think 15 years, and there's really been little progress. But I am hopeful because I think things are starting to shift, and it's starting to uh, heart failure and end of life is starting to take more of a presence um, uh, around this time. So there's very little knowledge. Uh, patients have very little knowledge of their diagnosis. And we'll talk about that, the reasons for that coming up in a little bit when we look at the barriers. Um, they often think that their symptoms are related to advancing age or lung problems, other comorbidities. Um, Agard at, at L had, had a, done a study where they found 34 of 40 patients had very little understanding of their diagnosis. Few had discussions of their prognosis. So again, Strachan and L um, quantitative assume that well, just over 11% had had discussions of prognosis. 46% of patients that they looked at wanted to have these conversations. So clearly there's a huge gap there that, that we, uh, we need to attend to. On a more positive side, uh, Formiga, uh, Formiga et al. found that 64% of the study participants that they worked with did understand their diagnosis and their prognosis. And um, they, they felt that was related to um, recent educational uh, strategies around heart failure. So, so that's a, a positive note. And then other current states of end-of-life communication, so that as we've already stated in other ways, end-of-life wishes are, are really not being explored. So uh, few patients have discussions around their preferences for CPR, advanced care planning, seldom discussed. And 
uh, preferences for end of life care, like where they would like to die, was seldom discussed. Uh, Formiga et al. found that only two out of 80 patients had discussed wishes regarding uh, life sustaining therapies with their physician. So, lots of room for improvement. So, we know what really uh, the current state sounds pretty dismal, but what do patients actually want? So what are their attitudes towards end-of-life communication? And I just pick, picked a few slides, uh, quotes here because I thought they really spoke to what people want. Um, there's definitely, the literature shows a group of individuals who really want early communication in heart failure. They, they want it, some patients want it as soon as they are diagnosed. They feel that it is their right to have that information they want to participate as fully as possible in their, in their health care decisions. They want to participate when they are fully alert and when they are able to, um, they have the energy to participate in making their decisions. Um, so, example, uh, they would feel cheated if they, were waste, if they wasted the time that was uh, available to them if no one had told them. On the other hand, there is a, a large number of patients uh, in the literature that really show they're very hesitant, indifferent, or they avoid altogether um, conversations around end of life. And so this is an example is that they tried to tell me, but I stick my head in a, in a hole. And that came from, um, you know, the general thought around that was patients really didn't want their hope removed. Um, they found it too distressing to think about end of life. Um, they would they would worry about what was to come. They were worried about their family. Um, some patients thought, you know, it's inevitable, so why worry about it? And others chose to just take it one day at a time. So a wide variance in what patients want around communication. So now we're going to just quickly look at the four barriers that they broke down to. So the end of life communication barriers, in the, it specifically to the heart failure population, broke down into patient caregiver, disease specific, healthcare professional, and institutional barriers. So patient caregiver barriers, um, terminology was, was a biggie. And this quote, I think, again speaks volumes, the fancy words that loses me completely. I don't, it, it don't mean a damn thing, does it? Not to me. Um, and so I, I thought that was very, very telling of where some patients are at when we start throwing these, these, these terms around. Um, Aldred et al. found that patients often find the term heart failure to sound very fatal. And in fact, uh, I was interested to hear my neighbor say that very thing the other day. He initially was very frightened by the term heart failure, but once it was explained, he became um, more comfortable with, with what was going on. So um, important to keep in our minds as we, we are fearful of using these terms, but they do have a big impact. And left ventricular failure, all the different types of terminology that was used, often left, if not explained further, often left patients very confused, left them fearful, and even disengaged with their health care because they just couldn't kind of make it make sense. Other barriers were that patients often associated uh, heart failure with periods of exacerbations only. Now, this I thought was very interesting, but often it was when they were in hospital, in acute care, being treated for exacerbations. That's the only time they'd ever heard heart failure. Physicians might not have ever used that word for reasons we'll, we'll hear about in a little bit, um, and knowing that it causes angst to patients and family. So they might not have ever heard of that term. They may, some patients in the literature um, began to uh, believe that they only had it when they were in, when they were in, um, in hospital. And so once they were out of hospital and they were over their exacerbation, they really didn't consider themselves to heart failure at that point. Timing is also an interesting barrier. So we heard earlier that some people want the conversations really early, some people don't want to have the conversations at all. Um, but what was interesting about uh, what the literature was showing is patients, um, some patients want to have the conversations or say they want to have the conversations when they're really well. Um, and not obviously when they're in, uh, in acute care and an exacerbation. 
uh, which, which kind of makes sense. But then once they're well, they also don't want to have the conversation, uh, obviously some patients. Um, so it kind of puts uh, healthcare providers in a bit of a quandary. What do we do with all these variances of what these patients want? Other barriers are fear of asking and waiting for the MD to, to raise the question. So fear of asking um, it encompasses many, many things. And it's, I think, quite commonly understood that many, certainly not all elders, uh, I was just with my mother on the weekend and I know she would not be shy about asking, but many elders um, have a discomfort with challenging or even just questioning um, um, healthcare providers. Um, there is a fear for some of the literature shows, for some of the patients, a fear of upsetting the physician, that the topic might be taboo, um, that the physician may be seen as being challenged by the, uh, by the patient or family, so they really don't want to, to raise it. Um, and so they often find healthcare providers unapproachable as well. So they often wait for the, for the MD or the healthcare provider to raise raise end of life uh, conversation and they of course often do not get raised. So very um, lots in there to tease apart but lots of, of things to, to work on to try to improve end of life communication. Um, we spoke a bit more about this a bit about this earlier but patients can feel very removed and disempowered. Um, very sadly um, Caldwell et al found that some patients doubted their opinions would make any difference. Um, to the care that they received, so they just they just kept mum about it. Um, some patients handed over their care uh, to the healthcare providers, believing that they would know what's best for them. Um, some patients in the literature expressed that physicians probably wouldn't would tell them what they needed to know, while others they won't tell. They'll only tell me what they want me to know because they think I'm too stupid or disinterested to tell me the rest. So really resulted in, in patients feeling disempowered. And thoughts about dying. Uh, many people in the literature thought about dying, but often in the context of aging, rather than with uh, because of heart failure, or only when they were hospitalized. And so as soon as they were out of hospital, they never gave dying um, a, a thought again. And some of the research shows that that patients, when they were approached while well, they were in hospital, because of exacerbations about end of life information, when they were approached um, by the researchers, they really didn't understand why the researchers would be talking about that with them. Um, and the other part of this is that heart failure is often viewed uh, by uh, certainly the public and sometimes by healthcare providers as benign and not, it doesn't have the same connotation as a cancer diagnosis. So um, not as worrisome for some people. On the other hand, Horn and Payne found that patients, some patients in their study um, thought about death on a daily basis. Um, they worried about their family and they're worried about the dying process. So, so when, when we hear that, I just, I just wonder how, how we could support so that patient and family um, in communicating around end of life and what they might expect and, and how much better that might uh, potentially make them feel. Now, caregiver specific barriers, they're quite frankly very similar to the patient's um, uh, barriers, but often um, uncomfortable raising the questions. Uh, they were often anxious, so they just avoided altogether. And even if they were interested in getting information, um, some of the research shows that they weren't able to, to get it. And if you have healthcare providers who have a discomfort, which you're about to hear with having this discussion, uh, it's not surprising that they, they were unable to get the information they wanted. Disease specific barriers are, um, well, probably one of the more the most challenging parts of this because you, you really can't change. Um, um, some of these, these barriers. Um, prognosis is virtually, uh, I wouldn't say, I don't know if I can say that it's impossible, but incredibly challenging. And therefore, um, if physicians feel that they cannot give a prognosis, they just choose not to have a discussion about it. So rather than say, we don't know, they choose to just not do it. Um, because it is impossible. And I don't know how many of you have 
have that with the patient um, when they come up maybe from a merge or another area and they are thought to be within the last few hours of their life and the next morning you come back in and they're sitting on the edge of the bed um, so eating so it's incredibly difficult to know when are these patients um, really at the dying phase when are they really there so uh, so it's just not often talked about and physicians often uh, in some of the research because they thought that uh, comorbidities would likely take the patient's life first, they, they actually didn't feel it necessary to discuss uh, prognosis of heart failure. Uh, likewise, trajectory is very tricky in heart failure. There isn't one um, you know, long, slow decline like we're kind of more used to in, in the cancer trajectory. There's multiple trajectories. 33% of patients that are diagnosed with heart failure die within the first year. And and of those that go on further, there are other um, uh, multiple exacerbations usually, and patients can go on and linger with a lot of symptoms for a long time um, uh, and, and recover. So the trajectories are just not what we're used to. Therefore, how, I, from a, a physician perspective, how are they supposed to um, kind of translate that into communication? that is not alarming to a patient and family. But it also then creates uh, difficulty in seeing when end of life is, is nearing. Uh, confusion, which is related to uh, heart failure because of poor brain flow to the brain, uh, sorry, blood flow to the brain, um, obviously makes an impact on if communication might be might be happening, but for, but potentially the patients will be able to fully participate because they uh, they can't because of this uh, confusion. And then mobility and um, uh, and dyspnea were also noted in the research for for causing uh, difficulties for patients and their families to get to appointments. So if you're not being able to leave your home because you're so symptomatic. Um, you can't get to a place necessarily where you can have these conversations with healthcare providers. Healthcare uh, professional barriers, uh, again, uh, um, very interesting, but not really surprising, most of them. Um, fears of handling people's emotions certainly um, came up in the literature and came up for me when I was, uh, uh, when I participate in the heart failure clinic uh, meetings. With the staff there. They, they just didn't want to have the conversation. They didn't know how to handle the emotions. They didn't want to send patients home after having said that, said, had the conversation. So they really just didn't have the conversation. That, that stopped it right there. They didn't want to remove hope. So they don't um, understand, or obviously, that there is a way to have these conversations without removing hope. Um, but one thing I found very interesting is that in one of the, one of the studies, um, a physician actually told the patient one prognosis and told the family the, what he really thought the prognosis was. And so he just didn't want to remove the hope from this patient and family. But of course, giving them two different diagnoses puts them on different, a different page and really impacts uh, certainly quality of life and potentially treatments that the patient might, uh, decisions that the patient might choose to make. Um, all in all, um, often fears of distressing patients, and so they just would not even attempt the conversation. Certainly, um, lack of communication skill and training was mentioned frequently from uh, all manner of healthcare providers, certainly physicians and, uh, and nurses alike. Um, and I don't know who, who among us can say that we've had a lot of education in, in communication skills and training. I, I kind of got mine on the job once I came to palliative care um, for the most part. And so there's a real um, discomfort with it. And so uh, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, healthcare providers often find it difficult to find the right words, so they just avoid it. Um, communication, when it does happen, um, the, the research shows that patients often and families found it very paternalistic, very one way. So there wasn't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of interaction. It certainly wasn't patient-centered um, 
uh, communication. And Caldwell found that patients uh, felt poor communication skills in a healthcare provider was definitely a barrier. So they weren't, if, if they thought that the healthcare provider couldn't really carry the conversation, they were less inclined to participate in that as well. Terminology for healthcare professionals was also uh, a barrier. So we heard earlier that patients um, really didn't like the word heart failure, found it very fatalistic, and, and so too, uh, similarly, our healthcare providers don't like using the term, so they just avoid it altogether. Um, they also, uh, some physicians actually to avoid the heart failure, using the heart failure term, using even other terminology to explain heart failure, they, uh, the literature shows they would simply treat the symptoms but not ever tell the patients that they have heart failure. So uh, they avoided it altogether that way. And again, they often, the literature shows that some physicians felt that other uh, comorbidities would take their lives, so they really didn't have to share that information. Uh, otherwise, physicians may revert to using um, uh, really complex terminology such as left ventricular failure, ventricular dysfunction, or they may use uh, euphemisms such as tired heart syndrome. And so what this does is it, it kind of insulates and protects the healthcare professional, um, but the patient, of course, is left very, very confused about what is going on. They, it leads to poor understanding of, of their disease and how their symptoms are, are related to it and how, obviously, um, that it's a life-limiting illness, they ne may never get that from the euphemism. Interestingly, though, if euphemisms were used by healthcare providers and the patients and families felt that the healthcare provider had good communication um, skills, they thought the use of euphemisms was, was good. But if they felt that the healthcare provider had very poor communication skills, they really saw the, the euphemisms as, as a way of avoiding the truth. Very astute um, patients and families out there. Um, other bar barriers were feeling uh, a failure, so professional failure is uh, what came out of uh, Barnes et al. Uh, research. Um, and certainly, I, I have witnessed that in, in my clinical practice as well, working with the team. Um, and that can often lead to a focus on intervention, life prolonging technological interventions. So, such as things like implanted cardioverter, defibrillators, um, left ventricular devices. So, there's lots of focus on that and, and very little focus on um, the fact that the patient is truly, potentially, uh, nearing the end of their life. And if you focus on that, you don't have to deal with the end of life. That's kind of um, what came out of the, the literature. Interestingly, um, Caldwell's study found that a patient really found that physicians compartmentalized cardiac care. And, and he, he said that they look at one thing and only one thing. Um, and so that, you know, no one, no one seems uh, to be able to say, well, um, this is it. Um, so patients definitely are, are, as I said, astute in catching, catching on to some of the healthcare provider barriers. And in the end, um, the in the end, a difficulty uh, recognizing end of life that that it's approaching. And so that's not surprising if they feel like they're a failure, if they focus on intervention. It's not surprising that they're not recognizing end of life. Uh, it also, you know, their trajectory also is pulled into that. Um, the literature shows that they often um, uh, don't know that what end of life care is. They don't know the options that are available to them. Um, so that obviously makes a huge impact as well. Institutional barriers. So there are definitely uh, a number of these. Um, lack of communication was a, was a fairly significant one in the literature as well. So conversations may take place, but they're not necessarily communicated to uh, other healthcare providers. And I also saw this in, in, my, in the clinical meetings, the clinic meetings where health 
care, uh, the, the clinic nurses would not be uh, certain about what the physicians had told the patient. They wouldn't be certain about what other options were available. So that really um, creates barriers to, to moving forward with end of life conversations. Uh, role clarity was a problem um, identified. Barnes at L found that um, the more healthcare providers that are in, um, involved with, with these patients, the more confusion was created around who, whose responsibility is it to have these, um, these conversations. And so the literature shows that some feel it should be the cardiologist, others feel it should be the primary care physician, and yet others feel like it should be whoever has the best relationship with them. Um, some saying, of course, nursing should because nurses often have uh, the closest relationship with these patients. Lack of time uh, was certainly noted and in, my, in the clinic setting as well, um, as well as appropriate environment was raised repeatedly by the, the team that I work with uh, and within, worked with and as well as within the literature. There's just no time. These, and we know that these conversations are not going to be quick. Um, so we have to uh, really try to factor that into the, what's important at end of life and, and having these conversations, as well as creating uh, environments where we can support patients and families to have these conversations. So um, in closing, I just jotted down a few implications for practice. And I'm by no means is this a list, but um, really looking at the research that, that came out of the, the barriers that I identified, uh, I would say that it's really important to engage patients and families early in the trajectory. And um, I know that from working with nurses, we often feel um, a lot of discomfort around having these conversations, but I, I think that uh, if you are able to initiate these um, these conversations with patients and family and really take a patient-centered approach. It's very empowering and, and you can um, only imagine how much patients and families um, appreciate your support um, even early on, just having somebody that understands that they need, they need to talk to physicians. Um, they need to arrange a family meeting. And so often it's not nurses going off and having, we're not suggesting that you go off and have discussions around prognosis and trajectory, but uh, I would just take a patient-centered approach, ask patients what information they need, and, and pull in the team um, for, for a team meeting to sit down with patients and families and, and find out what their needs are and move forward with that. Um, patient caregiver education, I know that, uh, uh, so that we can empower patients and we can Empower, educate them and empower them to ask questions. Um, and I know that that is starting to uh, happen throughout the uh, province of uh, British Columbia. With the heart failure strategy, there's a lot more patient caregiver education that's being offered. Interspecialty training and just creating opportunities to be um, around each other, healthcare providers, uh, sorry, um, uh, interdisciplinary, but interspecialty as well. So my experience of working with the heart failure clinic group has been very rewarding because, uh, of course, I am there to help support them, uh, provide uh, a palliative approach to the, their patients. But I am also learning. I'm learning about the devices, why they're why they're appropriate, um, and and just learning each other's language. I think is a big part of it. So creating opportunities for that. Obviously, uh, communication skills, and really, it would be great to create uh, interspecialty, uh, interdisciplinary communication skills education as well, um, because I think that there's a lot of very um, easy, if you will, phrases that we can use to start conversation that really are, are not overwhelming and not, not scary. And you'd find yourself actually asking more questions than answering more, but if, if, we, if we took these communication skills, I was able to do something like this for the heart failure team. We, we did a three-part um, session, and uh, it, was, it was very effective. I think there's more work to be done, but there was, a, there was a, certainly uptake of the information that was shared. Guidelines and tools. 
Um, certainly there are heart failure guidelines, there's the BC and Canadian guidelines, but and they certainly suggest that these conversations and the right conversations have to, ask, have to happen earlier, but, but it kind of ends there. And so if no one has communication skills and they don't know when to start these, I think there could be more guidelines or tools that might help healthcare providers know when and how to have these conversations. And then research opportunities and um, the ones that just come to the top of my mind because they really weren't addressed in the research were um, really from a cultural perspective, how does uh, how is that impacted in end of life communication? Um, you know, from a healthcare provider perspective and from a, a patient and family perspective as well. So uh, we're coming to the close of the uh, presentation. I'll take questions in just a minute, but I just wanted to give you some information about iPanel. We already spoke briefly about it at the beginning, but uh, these are some people that you can contact if you want some more information, the, the, the leads. And, uh, and you can also go and join the iPanel.ca and, and uh, get some more information there. And um, finally, before I forget, um, uh, I highly recommend that you check out the archived iPanel presentations as well on InspireNet. I um, have not been able to participate live with these, but they're all archived there. And in particular, I'd like to point out Elizabeth Costin's uh, presentation, I believe it was from June, on difficult conversations. But I thought it was very informative. She also gave some just really simple practical tips and phrases on how to have conversations, difficult conversations with patients and families.